Hi, this is Lynn Langett for All Things Data, and this presentation is Amazon Web Services or AWS for the SQL Server Professional. So let's go ahead and get started. First, I'm going to talk a little bit about my background so you can understand why I'm talking to you about this topic. So I've been working in the worlds of relational and now non-relational data for over 14 years, and I am both a practicing data architect as well as a technical trainer and author. I work across the spectrum with data, and I've received some industry recognition for my work in creating technical resources that are useful. Most notably, I recently received from Microsoft the MVP for SQL Server. I've also been awarded from Google their equivalent of that, the GDE or, or uh, uh, Google Developer Expert for the cloud platform for 2012 and 2013, and uh, from 10Gen, the uh, award I received was Master for MongoDB. I am uh, creating a series of technical courseware for Pluralsight on the Google Cloud for developers. I've written for Developmenter on SQL Server, and I've published two books on SQL Server Business Intelligence. Also, I'm a former Microsoft full-time employee for years, ending in October 2011. Specifically to this presentation, I've done um, cloud implementations primarily on the AWS cloud since I left Microsoft in October 2011 and have worked in production with most of these services that I'll be talking about today. So first of all, what and why Amazon's cloud? AWS is Amazon Web Services or Amazon's cloud. Um, it is the First guy on the block, basically, set of services that Amazon was using themselves to host their own uh, e-commerce and other services. And it's been released as a set of commercial services out in the market for many years now, set of uh, compute, data, and more. We're going to focus on the compute aspect in this presentation as it's targeted to help uh, data professionals, i.e. SQL Server professionals, understand what the off offerings are. Amazon is seen justifiably as the market leader. They've been in market longest. They're most often offering their services at the most competitive price, and I see that they're most often used in production. That being said, there are, of course, alternatives to the Amazon Cloud, and I have many other technical resources you can take a look at if you're interested in learning more about the Google Cloud, Rackspace, uh, Windows Azure, um, and some of the other guys out there. So I snapped the screen off of um, AWS's uh, main portal site, and here they have a representation of all the services they have offered. Now, I'm not going to go over every service in this presentation. I'm going to focus on the ones that A, I think are most relevant to data professionals, and B, that I actually use. So I'll be focusing in the areas of uh, storage and content delivery and database. There will be a couple exceptions from compute networking, deployment management, and uh, app services, but mostly I'll be covering this the, the, and demoing the services in the red and blue sections here. So I'm going to start with uh, the except one of the exceptions to that, which is uh, AWS's virtual machines or EC2. Um, I started with the Amazon Cloud using EC2. That was my first service that I used, and um, I use it very very frequently to spin up VMs on demand for different types of business needs. So I'll use it for uh, training. As a technical trainer, I'll ask that my clients set up EC2 instances, um, or I will set up an instance and then replicate it, uh, and then use that to train on, so long as bandwidth is adequate in the classroom. Uh, testing, so I can do load testing, um, stress testing of production size loads and solutions um, in the cloud, and also I use it just for production. Another thing that I've done is I've helped clients to set up dev environments on EC2. So done quite a bit of work on EC2. So let me show you how that, that works. And I'll switch over here to the, the portal, so aws.amazon.com. And uh, one of the things I'll tell you, if you haven't signed up, you should sign up after you watch this presentation. AWS has a pretty generous first year free tier. Um, you can try out most of these services for free so long as you, you know, use them just to see how they work. You can't use them for production or anything um, for the first year. Now, post first year, it becomes tricky to try out Amazon. You have to really, really watch um, 
weather and how much free tier that they have. And this is this is actually something um, that's concernful when you when you try out Amazon because you can get uh, unwanted charges when trying things out if you don't pay attention. So I'm going to go ahead. And I'm going to go into my console, and I'm go I've already signed up, so I don't need to. Uh, I'm going to click on my console, and then it might ask me to authenticate. Yep, so it's asking me to authenticate. And here is here is the console. So inside of here, um, I'm going to go ahead and go to EC2. And inside of EC2, to start up a VM, I have a couple of different ways I could do it. I can start it up with this instance uh, creation tool or if there's a particular type of instance uh, that has you know, a certain operating system and certain services on it, I can use an AMI or an Amazon mas machine image. Now another thing about instances, when you first start, you'll probably just set up a, a, an on-demand instance. Amazon has three types of pricing. They have spot, which is basically a very, very cheap instance. You can use it for load testing, for example, which only will spin up if they have extra capacity that's not used. It's kind of like the price line for VMs where you put in how much you want to pay and then if they have some instances not used, uh, uh, then you may get that instance spun up. You may or may not. And reserved is where you're running production and you know you want instances and you just pay for them in advance, basically. Um, now there's a whole bunch of other things you can do around here in terms of IP and um, security groups and all that. I'm not going to get into all that in this basic presentation. You notice over here they have some featured software things like uh, Tengen, uh, MongoDB, and they have a LAMP stack. Also here they show the service status. So if I click on launch instance, you can see I have the classic wizard. Um, I'm actually going to cancel this and make my browser a little bit bigger so you can see it. I've got my browser scaled down. That's a little easier to see. So I click on Launch Instance. Then you can see I have Basic Instance here, or I have a Quick Launch Wizard, where I can pick, and I have to pick a key pair for security. Um, or I can go to the AWS Marketplace, which will uh, allow me to work with images that have been further customized. So I go to the Classic Wizard here, and I say Continue. Then what I want to do is I can pick these instances here, or if I have AMIs that I've stored, I can spin them up here. Or community AAP AMIs, I can go for them here. And I'll take a minute to um, load. Notice while it's coming up, you see free tier eligible if used with a micro instance. And I can set this to uh, Amazon images. Now one thing, one caveat that I'll give to you is if you're using public images, you should know the source because there has been some um, undesirable software on some of these public images so you know know the source so if you have um, Amazon images those are generally going to be okay of course so for example if you wanted Windows you could select one of these Windows images and then you could see um, information about it and you can say where this instance is going to be set which availability zone um, and to have free tier you want to use micro but for any sort of production you're going to use you know, one of these various configurations depending on what your compute needs are. And they have a focus on, as you can see, high memory, high CPU, cluster, um, and they even have GPU, which is pretty interesting. Um, but they'll be priced, you know, accordingly. So um, notice I can launch an EBS optimized instance. I'll talk about what that is in, in just a few minutes here. That has to do with the, the storage that's being backed on this. If I want to request a spot instance, I can say that. Here I can put the price in, okay, but I, I want a regular instance. Notice the price was 0 0.0006 cents per hour. And then I can turn on CloudWatch for monitoring, um, and I can uh, add termination protect protection, and I can change shutdown behavior, so I can you know, terminate or stop. Um, and then I can put in an IM role, which puts it into a data pipeline. And I can say next. Now I want to say, um, where my storage device is. I say uh, next. And then I want to work with a key pair um, uh, if, if I want to add any metadata to it. And then I here's my key pair for security so I can log on. And then I want to configure firewall. And then I'm basically ready to launch.
uh, I picked an instance with SQL Server, and there it's telling me that it's not supported for this instance um, for Micro. So if I went back and I changed that, which is nice about the wizard, you can go forward and back, and I changed it to a regular. Let's change it to a small, and let's see if this one is running with SQL Server on it now. And now it's going to launch. So there's my instance. I can check the alarms. I can create additional volumes. And I can view my instance on the instance page. So there it's going to spin up. And it's uh, uh, 50 minutes. So 10 minutes till the hour. I'll tell you how long it takes for this thing to spin up. And once it spins up, then you can RDP to it. And you have full control. You're administrator of the image. So there it is. And I click on it and I have my actions and I can connect. Um, now one of the important things about working with this if you're using it for trying stuff out like training or load testing is there's a charge for the storage but the main charge is for, for the, of the, of the um, drive space but the main charge is for the compute. So you can stop and start and then your, your uh, fees will go down quite a lot. Um, so for training images, for example. So if I say uh, connect, so now um, I would need to download my, uh, retrieve my password here. And it's not available yet because it has to uh, finish spinning up. So it says password generation can take up to 30 minutes. Please wait 15 minutes before launching to, um, to, uh, go, to go in. So that is something to... Uh, uh, understand with the size of an instance it can take a few minutes for it to spin up but of course for training or something you do it in advance so then when you would be done you would just go ahead and, and connect to it and uh, that's really all there is to EC2 I'll come back to it um, uh, you can create your own VM and upload it here this runs on any operating system it's truly infrastructure as a service um, controlling pricing is something from a practical point that you do want to do when you work with this because pricing can vary quite a lot as you can see from reserved spot and um, other instances. Another thing generally about AWS is I'll be working in this web console. Um, there are some other ways to work with AWS. There's a scripting language if you prefer to script and there's, um, there's documentation on that. There's also a .NET SDK so you can actually bring it into Visual Studio and programmatically work with all the services, which is, I found to be very easy to use as well. So I mentioned uh, that, that EC2 is, of course, backed by storage. So cloud storage is really where we start our journey as understanding AWS for the, the SQL Server professional. And in addition to EC2, I also very, very often use their core storage, which is called S3. And uh, they now have a new type of storage called Glacier. So S3, you can think of as, um, it manifests itself, it looks like a, a file system in the sky. So it has um, this concept of a bucket, so that would be like a drive. And then it has uh, folders, and then you have files inside of there. So, um, and it's very, very fast and very, very cheap. So that's really the standard. Now, another way to think of this is a NoSQL key value store because you basically have uh, an ID which isn't exposed through this interface and then you can store any type of object. So you can store um, blobs, you can store, you know, movies, you can store pictures, uh, anything that you want. Um, S3 is used really by every customer that, I, that I've worked with. It's, a, it's the de facto standard for uh, storage. Now, there are other guys out there like Azure Tables, and uh, Google actually has an offering to Google Cloud Storage, but um, I just find that all my customers are using this in one way or another. Now, an interesting aspect of S3 is that there was a new storage announced last year, which is um, some people are calling the new tape backup, which is Glacier. Um, and Glacier is a long-term long archival storage that's about, uh, well, it's fractionally of the cost of S3 to send information in. Now, Gl Glacier is slow to send information in. It's not really for, you know, interactive use. It's for archiving. And it also will cost you to get the information out. So it's important to understand that. So uh, before I demo S3 and Glacier, I want to go back to EC2 
and tell you that uh, it uses S3 storage by default with a 10 gigabyte max size drive. Um, and it's, it has three copies, it's redundant. Um, it's, it can use EBS, as you saw when we ran the wizard, elastic block storage. Um, and the uh, key difference to that is S3 is got this capped size. So if you're running um, EC2 and you wanna have um, a volume or drive that is expandable or can be uh, started and stopped, um, you need to select uh, EBS. Um, you can also store the EBS volume as an AMI. Um, it does cost more. It is one copy only, so it's faster as well. So it's important you understand when you set up EC2 or when you use other storage um, how that works. So let me switch back over to the console. And uh, let's see if there's anything else interesting about this if I refresh it. So I'm still in EC2 here and it's completely running and it's got the status checks on. So when you RDP to it, by the way, you would just use the stuff down here. Status checks. That's a little squished for the recording. There's the monitoring. Uh, let me go here and let me scroll down. There's the DNS for it right there. So you can just RDP into that. Although it gives you the it gives you the way to do that if you right click on it. So in here you can see um, connect. Now if I wanted to stop this, terminate means delete, um, stop means stop. So stop would be, it says, please note any data on the ephemeral storage of your instance will be lost. Because remember, we in this one went with the default, which was S3. So if you want to stop and start, you want to pick EBS. Okay, just wanted to remind you. Let me go back to the, I'm going to actually delete this. Terminate this. It says, are you sure you want to terminate? Yes. Okay. So now it's shutting down and terminating. Now let me go back and go to S3. So the mechanics of working with S3 are super simple. So you create a bucket, and I'll call this one uh, YouTube Demo. And in a location, So I'm in uh, California, so I'll put California. Now, if you want to set up logging, you can do that. Oh, lowercase. Okay, so I need to get lowercase YouTube demo and set up logging. So I can um, log to get access logs if I have like some secure information inside of here, but I'm not going to do that because I don't want to want to log. I'm just going to click create. And that's going to give me my bucket. Now, inside of my bucket, I can um, work with all these different properties over here. So you can see that I first have permissions. So who has permissions? I can add a bucket policy. And there's a policy generator here. So quite sophisticated security. I can actually host a website here, a static website, which is sort of interesting. There's my endpoint. And there's a video to know how to do that. Uh, there's the logging information if I wanted to configure that. Uh, notifications. Enabling notifications causes message to be published to the Amazon Simple Notification Service topic when Amazon S3 detects that a reduced redundancy storage object stored in this bucket is lost. So this is if you have, um, you know, some change to the bucket and you want to be aware of it. Life cycle, this is very interesting. You can manage the life cycle of objects by using life cycle rules. Rules enable you to automatically archive objects to Glacier and remove them. So this is a use case that I've worked with with some customers. So I say rule, enabled, rule name, apply to entire bucket, or a prefix, like you know if you want all your movie files or something over there. Days from creation or effective, and then you can expire them, expire the object or delete it basically. Or you can move it to Glacier, and move it to Glacier with X time period, okay? So really a handy feature there. You can have tags. Uh, this is interesting, requester pays. Requester pays on the bucket causes the requester instead of the bucket owner to pay for the charges. So you can have version control. So once you enable, you can't disable it, and you will not be able to add lifecycle rules. So I'm gonna go here, and I'll just upload and add files, and I'll pick 
something here. I'll pick one of my one of my photos, I guess. And you can see uh, I can set the details. And it's already started the upload and start upload. And then if I click on it here, then I can open it. And there is my handsome collaborator and partner in crime, Llewellyn Falco. I can also download. I have properties to set with this. So here's details. Notice I can encrypt it. I can set unique permissions. I can assign metadata. Now another thing that I can do with this is I can make it public. And if I make it public, yeah, here's the link right here. So now this is a public, um, a publicly addressable URL. So that's a handy thing that I've used um, as well. So um, S3, super easy to use. I can make a folder inside of here too. And again, it has the APIs with it. Amazon Glacier doesn't have um, a sophistication in the interface. It really, you can just see your bucket. So our vault in here it's called. So you can just see your vault and you can see that you have uh, stuff in it basically, but you can't upload to it from here. So um, there is a, something that I've used. I'll just bring it up for you guys to see. It's called Fast Glacier. Um, it's for .NET. And there's a free version. Oh, it looks like there's one for the Mac now too. I should download that. Fast Glacier. Um, and it allows you to just, let me see if there's a screenshot of it here. Well, it looks like S3 basically. So very, very simple to use. Um, but you'll see when you use Fast Glacier, if you want a GUI to put um, items into your uh, Glacier storage vault, that the, the storage, the transfer rate is much slower than S3. It's, for, it's optimized for cheap storage, not for fast transfer. So, but the two of them together are really, really, really powerful. So, um, and this is just works with a vault, basically, is the concept of it. All right, so let's go back. So I showed you S3, and I showed you Glacier. All right, the next item of interest in the Amazon stack is uh, uh, remote database services. Remote database services is a type of EC2 instance uh, where Amazon has done some customization and they do some management of a service. In this case, they do management of a database service. So as you could run SQL Server on an EC2 instance and have complete and full control, and you might choose to do that, you may also choose to use um, RDS with SQL Server on it because Amazon takes care of some of the management of some of the common tasks, and I'll show you what they are here. So uh, when you're setting up RDS, just like with um, EC2, you can use a wizard. That's the easiest way, and there's some pre-configured uh, database types. So let me uh, show you what this looks like. So um, relate, uh, manage relational database service, RDS. And of course this costs more than EC2. That's something to be aware of because Amazon is managing some of the services for you. So here we have a DB instance and you'll see over on the right side here you have DB instances, you have snapshots uh, reserved just like with EC2 um, and uh, we're going to go ahead and launch. Oh, and then they have um, Elastic Cache, which if you're using production, you might wanna, want to want their caching service as well. So they have that shown on this page. They also have the, the service health shown on this page. All right, so I'm going to launch an instance. Oh, I'm going to actually try out the new look. I like to try new things. Oh, cool. All right, so I'm going to say launch DB instance. And I have choices from uh, the relational database world. I have MySQL, I have Oracle, and I have SQL Server. Now with SQL Server, the free tier works with the Express Edition, um, which I'm going to show here, a max of 10 gigs. The, uh, the hosted instances are SQL 2008 or 2012, and they work with Standard and Enterprise. Um, notice there's a Web Edition as well available here. So I'm going to go ahead and select this one. And uh, the models for licensing in this are license included for the everything other than enterprise. 
Um, there's a bring your own um, or license included. So you'll want to look that up if you're running anything production on here, obviously, before you before you run that. So it's SQL 2012, you can see, or, or 2008 R2. And then the instance class, I'm going to go with micro. And then the multi-availability zone is not available for micro. Um, and here's some really interesting aspects. This is you know what you're paying for versus running it on EC2. So the allocated storage, I'm going to say 20 gigs. Um, notice maximum 1024, although I think for micro this might be too big. This is a really interesting set of functionality here, provisioned IOPS. Provisioned IOPS is the minimum number of IO operations per second this DB instance will support. This is really to me the reason, one of the big reasons to use RDS versus um, EC2 for SQL Server for a production because this is a performance guarantee. So I'm going to call this a uh, Lin YouTube and uh, set a master username and password. Uh, and I have to set one that is got appropriate characters, so let me do that. All right, the default port here is 1433. Um, I didn't set an availability zone, um, and I have uh, parameter groups if I want to associate with the DB instance, so if you have some production thing going. All right, this is another set of services that is different in RDS versus EC2 for SQL Server. Um, Amazon can take care of the backups for you if you want. So enable automated backups, yes. Backup retention period one day. Backup window, you can select a window. And a maintenance window, you can select a window. Now if you don't want Amazon to take care of the backups, you can say no. And then you just set the maintenance window and then you can do backups. So I'm going to go ahead and turn this on. And I need a different time for this, of course. And let's see if that will work. Yeah, that should work. Okay, and then here's the here's the configuration information. And then we'll be able to work with this. Um, notice you can create your backup by taking a snapshot. And there's the caching. Now when this that comes up, the expectation is you'll connect with the management tools um, so that you would connect with um, SQL Server Management Studio. Under the instance actions, you have modify, reboot, delete. You can have read replicas, take snapshots, and you can restore at a point in time. So you have features that you're used to on-premise um, in this version of the cloud. It has lightweight management. So kind of recapping, RDS. Um, versus EC2 for SQL Server. What do you get from RDS? What, what you know, if you're going to select that, why would you want to use that? So provisioned IOPS is the big thing. Performance guarantees. Scheduled backups. You have the ability to do point in time restores. Scheduled maintenance windows, um, and you get full use for RDS of all SQL Server tools. Unlike, for example, Windows uh, SQL Azure, where you don't. Um, you get partial use there. You can use Profiler on Database Tuning Advisor. And uh, Amazon recently announced that RDS now supports availability groups as well for 2012 Enterprise, which is pretty fantastic. So um, it's, to me, the, the most premier offering of SQL Server partially managed on the cloud. I'm very excited about RDS. Very excited. Okay, so um, the next concept for us to talk about on the Amazon Cloud is uh, data warehousing as a service, which is pretty new. Um, it's called Redshift. So as it says here, Redshift is fast, powerful, managed petabyte scale. Petabyte, I'm emphasizing the word petabyte there. Um, it offers fast query performance when analyzing any data set using the same SQL Server tools and BI applications used today. Um, you launch a Redshift cluster. You start with gigabytes and scaling to a petabyte for under $1,000 per terabyte per year. So um, a lot of uh, excitement around the launch of this service, so we should probably take a look at this service as well. I'll note that Redshift uses Postgres rather than SQL Server, and so it requires tools for you to connect to Postgres to work with it. So if I say launch cluster, cluster identifier, lin YouTube, database name, lin tubes. 
database port, master username, master user password. Continue. Node type. Okay, so you have data warehouse uh, high extra large. Again, this is a type of EC2, see? And this is the CPU. So I have two cores per node, 15 gigs per node of memory, uh, two terabytes of storage per node, IO performance is moderate, and I can go uh, extra large there. So, and the cluster type can be multi-node. Maximum, I'm gonna go to the smaller one here. Maximum um, number of compute nodes. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and say two. I'm gonna take the minimum here. You can have up to 16. And then I can encrypt if I want to, and I can pick an availability zone. I have a security group, and I can continue. And it looks like everything is good there. And notice, it is not part of the free tier. It's a buck 70 an hour. So I gotta turn this thing off after I make this uh, video. So notice you can do um, some different things with pricing in terms of reserve nodes, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and say launch. And I'm going to go ahead and go here, and it's creating. So I'm gonna go ahead and pause the video, and I'll start back up once these things are created. While we were waiting for some of those other services to spin up, I went ahead and opened up a VM to show you what Fast Glacier looks like on Windows. So you can see it looks really like S3. If I want to create a new folder, I just say new folder, and I'll call it Lin YouTube. Say OK. And there, again, it's creating the folder. There's my folder. So really easy to work with. And then if I want to upload, a file I'll just say here and I'll say I'll pick some pictures or something and I'll pick something and you can see that um, it's an interface like S3 so once you this is here um, upload the file folder delete properties pretty easy to work with and here I can request last inventory. Notice that it takes four hours for a new file listing. So continuing on, my RDS instance is now available and you can see that I've copied the endpoint and I'm gonna show you what working with it in Management Studio looks like. So I've connected and you can see I'm connected. Now do remember this is a micro instance so uh, to save money. So it's uh, not gonna be probably super fast. Um, and if I want to create a new database, I just say new database. And uh, then I can work with this in a way that I'm familiar. I could also connect in Profiler or Database Tuning Advisor, so on and so forth. And again, um, I have found micro instances not to be super fast, um, but it gets the point across. So I'll say uh, Lin Tubes here and say OK. And I'm creating this. You notice the connection string here while this is creating is uh, on RDS. So um, I'll let this database create. And now I have this database and I can work with it in any way that I'm used to. So I can, for example, uh, I think I might have to install the support. I'm not sure, let me try. That's a fun thing with this. Yeah, yes, let's see if this works. and then say close and new table and I can just call this uh, customers so I'm working with the table designer here from management studio ID int whatever you can see how it works it's all the same tools which is uh, you know one of the reasons I think this is such a strong offering so um, let me go back to the deck And we need to see if Redshift is done. So let me go back to Redshift. And here. And our Redshift cluster is now healthy. So I can go inside of the cluster. And you can see here is my endpoint. And um, I can connect to it with JDBC, ODBC, 
Um, and again, I can uh, work with it in a similar uh, fashion to what I just showed you. So some really so strong, solid offerings around database services in the cloud that um, I think you know all of our SQL professionals need to be aware of. So something new, of course, is the NoSQL world. We, we looked at S3, which is a kind of a NoSQL, but um, Amazon's really solid offering here is something called DynamoDB, which is a pure key value store run on SSDs. So this one is real quick and easy to demo, so let me show you how that works. Um, so I go here, and I'm going to go to DynamoDB, and uh, bring that up. And I just pick a primary key, set my provision throughput, create my table, and I'm done. So I'm going to call this uh, customers. And I'm going to say that I want a string customer ID. And for my uh, primary key. And then I want my um, my throughput. And again, it, it this is one where if you're going to try this out, make sure you watch it so you don't end up getting a uh, undesired charges okay so it talks about this pricing so I'm just gonna say 1010 and say continue and then um, here's my alarm so it's at 80% so I'd get an email if read write was bigger than this it's just really small for demo obviously say create and it's creating and then um, just like everything else I have a really simple interface in here where I can um, work with my table as soon as it's created. Let's see if it's ready yet. It's still creating. And I can add um, my keys and values inside of it. So the idea is um, really fast, really scalable, um, simple NoSQL storage. I'll wait for that to cook and then I'll come back to it. So if you have even greater storage needs and, you know, huge storage and huge processing, um, Amazon does have a couple setups of Hadoop. So you can use MapReduce. It's called MapReduce, Elastic MapReduce. So uh, uh, each job is called a job flow. And uh, the way that it works is you put your data in S3 and then you create your job flow and then you get your results back out of S3. And let me go back and see if this thing is created yet. There, okay, so now I go inside of my customer table. I'm back on um, Dynamo here. And uh, let's see, can I work with it in here? I thought I could. Explore table, yeah. So in explore table, I can create a new item. Um, so customer ID one, um, and then uh, the value is Lynn, and customer ID two, and the value is Llewellyn and then I can put the items. Now let's see what's wrong with this. Oh, I need something here. Oh, customer ID, okay, I'll just say test. Okay, there, that looks right. All right, and say okay, and then I can browse the items and refresh to make sure they're there. Oh, I guess I only put, okay, customer ID test one is Lynn. I put it in the wrong format, but there it is, okay? So, and then I can click on the item, I can edit, copy, delete, and I have various tables. Okay. All right, so let me go back over, and I actually forgot what I was working on, so let me look here. Oh, MapReduce, okay. So now I'm going to go to MapReduce, which is um, another version of EC2 with Hadoop on it. This has got on Linux. So you create a job flow, and inside of here, my job flow, you can use the Amazon distribution, or you can use MapR, which has got some more functionality. They're one of the vendors that provides tooling around Hadoop. So you can run your own app. It's going to be a, a Hive um, command, a JAR, streaming, PIG, or HBase. Or you can run a sample. So um, then they've got word count, of course, and then they've got some other stuff. So I'll just do word count to show you how it works. And then um, it, they, their implementation is in Python of the map and reduce. So you have the input location. Here's where the, the input comes from. This is your S3 bucket. The output, you have to put your bucket name. And then here's the mapper. And then here's the reducer. And then um, once you do this, I, uh, I, I'm not going to try. Let me see if I, if I don't change the bucket name, if it'll still go on in the wizard. Yeah, OK, so I need an S3 bucket. I think I did. Lynn YouTube. 
may have to exist first. I don't remember. Lynn YouTube. I may pause the video if I have to get it to uh, exist. There, okay. And then you set it up on your instances so you can do a small all the way up to huge. And there's the spot pricing, you know, for running these data processing jobs, more cheap cost. Then here's the um, core instance and the task instance um, for the MapReduce itself. And then you have your key pair. You can have a S3 logging and you can have um, all the other EC2 type stuff here, termination protection. And then you can have bootstrap actions with a job flow. And then when you're ready to rock and roll, you just click create job flow. Okay, so I'm actually not going to spin this one up, just to show you how it works. So another new thing that Amazon launched last year, which is very interesting to us data professionals, is data pipelines. And the concept is kind of an SSIS across the Amazon cloud. So um, I'm assuming all the audience here is familiar with SSIS. It's very similar conceptually. You have activities and you have data nodes and you have pipelines. So I have a, just a sample set up here with S3 um, data and then RDS data, which is just from a template. And I'll actually show you what that looks like as well. So let me go back over here and go to data pipelines. And um, I'm going to say create new pipeline. I'm going to call it in YouTube and then I'm going to just say uh, the roles okay that's fine and then how the schedule works time series or cron create new pipeline then you have this blank palette that you can work on and just for speed I'm just going to pick a template so export Dynamo to S3 export S3 to Dynamo you can see how all the services work together copy S3 to RDS copy RDS cop run Hive Analytics this is a type of uh, MapReduce job copy on-premise MySQL to RDS. Um, so I'm going to say copy uh, S3 to RDS. And uh, there is your template. And you can see um, the screen's a little crunched here. Um, let me make this a little smaller so you can see it. These are the various nodes. And <clears throat> if I click on a node, if I click on a node, then um, you can work with the node itself and uh, set up the various properties. So let me switch back. Um, so uh, Amazon also has Amazon also has a, um, a platform as a service with Elastic Beanstalk, um, and this is comparable to Windows Azure uh, Worker Roles and Web Roles. And again, I'll let you explore this if you're interested in looking at it. An additional capability that you may want to take a look at is programming using a .NET language and Visual Studio against the AWS cloud. I'm just going to give you a really quick introduction and show you what the uh, add-in for Visual Studio looks like in this next demonstration. In this demonstration, I'm going to briefly introduce you to how the Amazon Web Services uh, Visual Studio SDK add-in looks. So I've got a, an instance of Visual Studio open here, and I'm going to say File, New, Project. And inside of here, I'm going to say Other uh, uh, Visual C Sharp and AWS. And I have three different templates, a console project, an empty project and a web project. And I'm just going to say console project and say OK. And then it's going to ask me which account that I'm going to use. I've already preset this up. Uh, you want the name, the access key, secret access, and account number. And you can also connect to the government cloud and say OK. And, um, and now it's creating that. So I'm going to go ahead and bring up the Solution Explorer. and. Um, it looks like that uh, the project just didn't load because I don't have the DLL in here, which is OK, no big deal. Um, this is actually SQL Server data tools, not full Visual Studio. Probably need the full thing. But the thing I really wanted to show you in addition to the template um, is the AWS Explorer, which does work here. So you can see inside of here, um, I'm connected to my account in a particular region, and I can see the various services of interest. So in EC2, I can see the AMIs. I could um, launch an instance from here. So if I right click and you can see I could just launch an instance from inside of here. Um, I could work with RDS. I could launch a DB instance from inside of here, including SQL Server. Uh, S3. I can work with any of my 
um, buckets. And you can see here's a viewer for my bucket. Uh, I can create a bucket. I can go inside this bucket and take a look at it. What's inside of it, I can upload, download, so on and so forth. Um, also, uh, it has a view into some of the other services as well. So these are the core ones that I use. Oh, DynamoDB as well, which I also showed. So um, if you're interested in programmatically accessing, I, I, I advise you to get the SDK and the add-in. It really makes development uh, quite a bit easier. So this is a quick intro to um, bringing in the AWS Explorer into Visual Studio environment. So to sum up, um, there are these uh, comparable offerings across Amazon, Google, Microsoft, and others, and you can see them listed on the chart here. Um, basically, it's an interesting time for us as data professionals because all the vendors are, are racing to um, improve their services. In fact, as I record this today, Microsoft announced that their VMs, or their AC2, if you will, has gone into general availability. Another thing to watch, and they um, said that they match Amazon's prices. Another thing to watch is um, price drops. So there have been many, many price drops on the services, as well, along with service ads. For example, RDS added SQL Server 2012 availability groups just a couple of months ago. So free uh, costs, I talked about um, free tier, using the free tier to get started. Um, and you can see this is for first year free tier. And there's information about the free tier for SQL Server on RDS and Dynamo. And there's an example of a monthly bill. So you can really uh, keep your bill down low when you're trying things out, even when you're beyond the first year, so long as you read and pay attention to all the different costs. Here's more about the pricing, regular pricing, smart EC2. Make sure that you pause your instances and dilute, delete them when you're done. And vanity pricing is set price alerts and use spot pricing. You can also resell reserved instances, so there's a lot more to know about pricing. Here's a um, comparison chart between AWS, Google, and Azure in terms of other types of services, free tier, compute, piecework, routing, virtual private clouds, and auto scaling. Notice I use right scale for that. So in conclusion, I use EC2 for testing, training, and some production, dev environments, S3 for archiving, read, write, Glacier for archiving, um, uh, read it in is slow, and ex uh, read it out is slow and expensive, write it in is fast and cheap, RDS for SQL Server high availability and partially managed SQL Server for production, Redshift for data warehousing on demand, Dynamo for fast NoSQL, and Ela Elastic MapReduce for um, easy Hadoop MapReduce. Um, in addition to the work I do with data, uh, Llewellyn Falco and I run a nonprofit to teach children to program. Um, we actually use the cloud as a point of interest, but we use Google's cloud for some information about our application. We have a new version of the course on Pluralsight for free for C Sharp. We have existing versions in Java and Small Basic. So, um, teach the next generation of our kids to be creators uh, as well as consumers of technology. And there's a bit more about me. And here's more information about SQL Pass. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed this Amazon presentation. I'm Lynn Langett for All Things Data.